Welcome back to the workshop guys, thank you for joining us again today. Now, today we are going to do the Anvil's Essential Buyer's Guide. So there are hundreds of different types of anvils out there on the market, from cutler's anvils to double bickers, single bickers, London pattern, um, all sorts of weird, wonderful shapes and sizes that they've made throughout the years. Now, your basic anvil, as you see before you, this is the London pattern. It's a typical anvil you get here in the United Kingdom. You've got your bick on the front or your horn. Uh, you've got your cutting table, which is typically softer for doing cutting on. Um, so if you drive your chisel in there, normally you don't take chunks out of your chisel. You, of course, got your working table. At the back end here, I've got my hardy hole. I've got my pritchel hole. And there is my basic anvil. Now, what do we use the different parts of the anvil for? As I said before, at the front end, you've got your bick. Not to be confused with other things, um, also called your horn. And we typically use it for doing things like bending up, um, forging scrolls, doing all sorts of different things. Now, you're not limited to just bending up on your bick. You can, in fact, use it for straightening as well. Um, simply hook your material on the end and you can pull back gently and use it to straighten out. Now, bicks on anvils, they come in all different shapes and sizes. Uh, this anvil, the bick is round. That's more of a modern adaptation. Um, typically, they're oval shaped and the oval, they've normally got a slight flat section in the center here. And that's quite good for opening out rings and making them larger, um, which you can't do quite so easily on a round one. Moving along, we of course got our cutting table. And as its name suggests, it is for cutting. And if you drive your uh, chisel into the cutting uh, face, it won't mar your chisel quite so badly, um, but it will leave a slight indentation in your cutting face. It's also quite handy having that little set down there because you can use it for doing little bending operations, um, doing things like dog legs in bars um, and all sorts of other little pieces. It's also quite handy as well if you're wire brushing. You can lock your work into that little shoulder there and you can use it as a bit of reinforcement when you come to doing wire brushing. Now your business part of your anvil, your table, this is the important part that you use for doing your forging out. Um, it helps if it's flat and free of marks because any marks or indentations that are in the surface of your anvil, they're going to transfer over into your work. Now on your anvil, you of course got the near side and you've got your far side. Um, you want a various degrees of radius on the edges, um, ideally free from cracks and from splits and from big holes. Um, mine here, I've got a sharp radius over here and that widens slightly um, to a slightly broader radius um, up by the cutting table. And I've got exactly the same on the inside of my anvil as well. I've got quite a sharp edge here by my hardy and I've got a bigger radius on this side. Um, and that makes a big difference when you're doing things like bending up around that anvil that you're not necessarily marking and galling the inside edge. Moving towards the back of the anvil, we of course got the hardy hole. Now that is there for holding hardy tools and things like uh, mandrels, or I quite often use mine for holding my hot cut hardy. Um, and it's a brilliant way of holding material down on the anvil and being able to work with different tools um, and bits of equipment. So typically I'm using my hardy for cutting material off. And that means that I could do it on my own without needing an extra pair of hands. Like so. Now, right at the back end, we of course, we've got our pritchel hole. Now, I use the pritchel quite often for starting bends off. It's quite handy for doing things like that. So the other thing we can use the pritchel for is of course punching holes. Or if we're making things like nails and we want to support the material. Now that narrow pritchel hole is much more versatile for doing that than the hardy. Uh, you've got more support around the material. So, you know, something small like that sits over the pritchel nice and easily and you can come in and do your nice rose head nail without mashing up the underside. Now, there are three main deciding factors when it comes to buying your anvil. Uh, you, of course, have got price. What can you afford and what can't you afford? You have got size and size matters in the anvil world like you would not believe. And of course, you've got condition. I would rather have a smaller anvil that was in better condition than a great big hunking lunk that has got big chunks missing out of it. Although you can repair an anvil, they're never quite the same. This one's actually my son's, who's five. Now, 
When it comes to prices of anvils, when I started smithing, you could pick up a good quality anvil for about a pound a kilo, um, which probably you can judge my age from that. Um, in recent years, especially with things like forged in fire, uh, really making hobby smithing a much bigger thing than it used to be, the prices of anvils have absolutely shot up. There's a few different places you can go to buy anvils. You've of course got eBay, um, you've got the foundries that actually make new ones. You've also got places like Facebook Marketplace, which is brilliant for picking up secondhand ones. Or you can do what I used to do, which is uh, go out and go around your local farms um, and ask if they've got an old one floating around in the shed somewhere. Uh, and most of them probably do. So when it comes to prices for anvils today, I'd expect to pay approximately two pound a kilo or a pound a pound. Um, you can convert that into whatever currency you like, um, but that's sort of the going price at the moment in 2021. So, of course, price, you know, it depends how much of a rush you're in and how keen you are on having that Pacific Anvil. If you're desperate, desperate and you need it tomorrow, then you expect to pay through the nose. If you've got time in your hands and you don't mind waiting and going back to the farmer and negotiating, you can probably pick up an anvil for a couple of crates of lager. Um, I know I have done in the past. Now, price isn't the only factor involved in buying an anvil. Of course, size is and size matters. As you saw with that little anvil, there ain't much you can do with it. You know, my five-year-old, yeah, he can have a tinker on there and he can bend up some metal and do a little bit of forging and he's perfectly happy. But for an adult, you're gonna want at least a hundred pound anvil um, for the very least. Your typical farrier, they start out quite small, but they're lugging the damn things in and out of vans all day um, and they're doing a different operation. You know, they're only forging small shoes typically. They don't wanna cart around a um, 250 kilo anvil with them everywhere because uh, they'd be absolutely knackered by the end of the day. Now this is the biggest anvil I've currently got in the shop and this one weighs approximately 250 kilos. It's a bit of a beast. Um, this is an old colliery anvil, came from the coal mine down in Caerphilly and uh, it's been in my workshop now for over 10 years. Um, it's a good piece, nice and hefty, doesn't go anywhere. Um, the advantage of having the bigger anvils are when you're working Smith and Stryker, they don't tend to migrate across the floor. They tend to stay exactly where you put them. This anvil over here is probably one of the smallest ones that we actually use in the shop. Um, typically, it's only getting used in our forging classes. I would say this one is probably 80, 100 kilos. It's not massive. Um, you know, it's only probably 16 inches, 18 inches across. Um, I think that's about a four inch face. But the big advantage of having a smaller anvil is that the bick is nice and sharp um, and tapers back quite nicely. Now, some of the bigger anvils, the bicks are actually really blunt and they limit the sort of size and shape of things that you can forge. So it's quite handy having a bit of a range in the workshop. Now, the other main feature with buying an anvil is its condition. And it's really important to pay great care and attention when you're forking out quite a significant amount of money, especially for something that's gonna live in your workshop forevermore. Um, this little anvil here didn't cost me a huge amount. I think it came from a local reclamation yard. Um, it didn't come from a local farmer. Now, it's not in too terrible condition and I could repair this one quite easily. But there are a few big factors. This one has clearly been sat outside in someone's garden for a number of years, and the face has quite a lot of pitting on it. Um, and that texture on that face, you're gonna transfer that into your work. When you're forging hot steel on top, all the marks and indentations on there are gonna transfer back into your piece of work. And they're gonna make your work look a little bit cruddy, to be honest. Um, but with a little bit of grinding on there, I could recondition this anvil quite nicely. Now, this old anvil has had a bit of a beating over the years. Someone has clearly plowed into it with something heavy, or it might have seen a little bit of action from a, a grinder and a cutting disc at some stage in its life. It's got a big ghoul in it. Um, that is unfortunately gonna be affecting your work. If you're forging rings and stuff, you're gonna be hitting into that uh, and leaving some nasty marks. Also, um, beyond the cutting face here, someone has taken a great big chunk out of this anvil. I should imagine, due to the age of this anvil, that it's probably a wrought iron body and it's got a steel face uh, fire welded on the top here um, and the corner of that has lost. However, it's still got a reasonably good ring to it. Now this little anvil over here um, is probably in the worst condition out of any of the anvils I've got in my workshop. Now the reason we hit an anvil and listen for that ring is to find out whether there's any delaminations or cracks running through that anvil. Now, listen out for this and see if you can hear it. There's no clear ring there and there is a dead spot in the center of this anvil. Um, again, this is a very old anvil. This one has a wrought iron body and a steel face welded to the top. And the steel face um, is missing several chunks. There's a big chunk missing out the edge there. Um, it's also starting to delaminate. Now, 
it may well have delaminated during its original forging process, um, but this anvil is probably 250 years old, 200 years old, and you could just about get by with it. If you're a hobby smith and you're just working on the weekends uh, and having a bit of a dabble, then, you know, yeah, sure, it would do the job, no problem at all. As a commercial smith who works uh, on the forge six or seven days a week, I need something in much better condition. Now the pick on this little red anvil has had an absolute beating. It's got a great big flat on the top where it's uh, been struck with sledgehammers repeatedly. And also at the end of the pick, it's starting to bend down where it's literally forging over. Um, but for something that's 200 years old, it's actually doing fairly well. By comparison, this is the anvil that I use typically every single day. Um, the surface is not mirror polished, but it's nice and smooth. There's no major hammer marks in here. I didn't buy this anvil from new, so there are some age-related marks. Someone's clearly missed at some stage and hit the anvil there. There's a couple of marks up by the hardy hole, um, probably from someone swinging a sledgehammer, but overall, the anvil is in great condition. There's no big cuts or dinks in my uh, bick on the end here. My cutting table is actually fairly smooth and clean. There's a tiny, tiny bit of mushrooming happening over by the uh, table here, um, but generally, my anvil is in pretty good condition and I can certainly forge a nice workout on this one. Now my big anvil in the corner isn't the only one I use. Um, quite regularly I come over to my double bick anvil, which is incredibly handy. If you fold in things like fire pans, you can come in on the square bick on the end and get it in there nice and tight. Um, you can also do things like forks, where you can get one tine under the other and still be forging on a nice flat surface. So it's great having a double bick anvil. Now, if I can find myself a double bick anvil that's as big as my one over there, I will probably snap it up in no time at all. Um, but unfortunately, this double bick has a few age-related marks in it. It's got a couple of dinks in the bick, and at some stage, someone has clouted the corners and it's lost quite a few chunks. It has been repaired though. Someone has taken a welder to this and built up the corners again. But in doing so, you do soften that uh, anvil face and it's never quite the same ever again. Um, the downside of welding up corners on anvils is it does make them quite brittle and prone to shooting bits across the workshop. So just be careful on that if you're gonna do it. Yes, you can fix an anvil, but I'd be wary about how much time and effort you put into it. Um, you know, if you're not in a great rush, then you know, keep your eyes peeled and maybe go with a different anvil. Now this old colliery anvil here is in pretty poor condition. Um, the face is still reasonably flat. There's no big hollows in there at all, but unfortunately it's had an awful lot of abuse and you can probably see some of the hammer marks in there. Um, when you're forging big things, it's not the end of the world, a couple of little dinks, but if you're forging things like hooks or little knives, having these indentations, they end up transferring into work and they can really throw you out. Um, also, you can see where someone has uh, tried to fix one of these holes and put a bit of stainless steel weld on the face there. It stands out like a sore thumb, but it probably fixed the problem. Um, another problem that you do tend to get on hardy holes is, you know, this one is absolutely enormous. It's about two inches across. Um, and someone at some stage welded a piece of box section in here to um, thin it down. Um, and that's then being gas cut out. So it's a bit rough around the edges. Um, there's a few edges that you could potentially cut yourselves on. Also, this anvil has things like um, cuts in it from an angle grinder, um, and there's another repair there on the back with a bit of stainless steel. So just be careful when you're, you're selecting anvils, try and avoid anything with any major marks in, uh, unless you want a nice big bill from the machine shop to mill the surface flat. <coughs> Now, this anvil over in this corner of the workshop is the first anvil I ever had. Uh, I think my parents bought this for me when I was 20, 21, um, from one of the local farmers. Uh, it didn't cost a huge amount of money back then, um, and it served me pretty well until I went off to college and did some proper commercial smithing. Um, this anvil does have the pointiest bick in the world, and it does owe me a few mobile phones, uh, so strongly advise taking your phones out your pocket before walking around the workshop. Um, Pritchell holes and hardy holes on anvils, they do come in different locations. Your typical London pattern, both of them are at the back end. Um, but the Pritchell on this anvil is right up at the front and it doesn't make a huge amount of difference. Um, sometimes it's handy having multiples on there, um, but you know, <clears throat> it is what it is. Now by far, this is the oldest anvil I've got in the workshop. It's several hundred years old. Um, it was probably used for making armor as well as doing other jobs around the place. Uh, it's quite handy. I use it if I'm doing some reenactment and I want to do some traditional forge work out, out and about in the country. Um, it's quite a nice shape and occasionally, 
it comes in quite handy. It's got a bit of a dome to it, so that can be quite useful sometimes. But generally, the corners are pretty good. Um, it's got a nice flat edge that I can work with. Um, and it's a good alternative, getting you know an anvil-shaped object if you haven't quite got the money to go out and get yourself a, a traditional sort of London pattern anvil. Now, I just mentioned anvil-shaped objects. And of course, if you haven't got the budget to run out and get yourself a double big anvil, at, you know, four pound a pound, um, then you can, of course, use any old bit of metal that you've got lying around the place um, or picked up from a scrapyard. One of the first things I did when I was younger and was trying to do a bit of forging was went and picked up an old sledgehammer head, sunk it into a log, uh, warmed up a bit of bar and started hammering on top of it. It's got a hardened face, it's only got a small body, but you know, if you're only doing a little bit of tinkering to try it out, it's not a bad option. Now, if you've got a bit more money and you're feeling a bit more adventurous, but you still can't afford that big anvil, um, you could, of course, run over to your local machine shop and pick up a nice bit of uh, steel. This is a chunk of H13, which would make an absolutely brilliant little anvil. Uh, set it in a wooden block again, so it's not gonna move anywhere because you haven't got that mass. Um, but, you know, I could drill a hole in there as a pritchel. I could weld a little box up to form a hardy hole um, and would generally do the job quite nicely for me. Okay, so that's anvil shaped objects. They're, they're handy, they've got their place. You can of course use railway line. Um, I see lots of those up on uh, eBay and people swinging hammers at those. Um, and they work quite well as well. Don't panic if you've got a beat up anvil, it's not the end of the world. As I said earlier, you can of course do repairs to them. Um, you can build the corners up. It's not ideal, but obviously it's better than having great big chunks missing out of the anvil. Um, you know, build them up with some weld. Make sure you're using the right filler rods. So always check with your welding suppliers uh, to make sure you're using the right type of filler. Um, you don't want to be squirting MIG wire, uh, mild steel MIG wire at the damn things. It won't do it any favors whatsoever and it'll just fling off in no time at all. It needs to be a dissimilar rod. Um, some people prefer hard facing to hard wearing. Uh, just depends um, on the anvil, uh, what it's made of as well. Because you've got cast uh, steel, you have got some cast iron. You've of course got raw iron as well. Um, and you know, it does depend. So try and check if you can what, what your anvil is made out of um, and check with your welding supplies as to what you can get. The other thing you can do to repair an anvil, uh, which is probably better than welding it, is to mill the top surface. Now you'll need a pretty big milling machine. I haven't got one in my shop that's big enough to actually mill an anvil, um, not sat on the bed anyway. Um, but if you skim two, three mil off the top, you'll reduce the weight a little bit but you'll leave yourself with an absolutely beautifully smooth uh, anvil and you'd probably get any wind out the anvil as well. So that's another possibility. But the downside of doing that is if the big machine shop does it for you, uh, they charge some serious money for a day's work and uh, you're gonna end up with a pretty hefty bill. So I'd probably steer away from that one um, unless you've got a big milling machine of your own or access to one at work or something similar. Um, but yeah, you know, keep your eyes peeled and you'll probably come up with an anvil fairly easily. So once you've gone and picked up yourself an anvil, you obviously want to keep it in as best condition as possible. Uh, so I strongly advise, unless you're in somewhere really dry, uh, that you don't leave it sat in the garden going rusty. Now, whatever you do, please don't go out and paint the face of your anvil to try and keep the rust off, because um, the next time you put some hot steel on there, you're going to end up burning it and inhaling all those horrible fumes as well, which isn't particularly nice. But it's sacrilege. You definitely don't want to be painting an anvil face. Now, there's nothing wrong at all in painting the body of the anvil. This one will have been painted a couple of times. Um, normally, what I will do is leave an inch down the face, um, down the sides of the anvil that I won't paint, um, and I'll, I'll leave that bare steel. Typically, I don't oil my anvils unless I'm not going to use them for a long time. What I tend to do is just put my apron over the top um, of my anvil at the end of each day, uh, and that's got enough sort of oil and, and whatnot on it to sort of keep the anvil in fairly good condition. Um, as you use it, it will polish up uh, and go shiny. This one was used on the weekend on a forging class, and most of the surfaces have had the rust knocked off, um, and it looks pretty good, to be honest. On the condition front and keeping it from going rusty, I would try and avoid putting heavy engine oils on your anvil. Uh, yes, it will displace that water and stop the water sitting on there. Um, but when you come to forge your next bit of hot steel on there, you're going to be kicking off all that smoke and gas. Um, you're not going to set your anvil on fire. That's not really a problem. But um, it's not the nicest stuff to be breathing in. And also, you don't want to be touching it and getting all oily and horrible either. Uh, but if I was going to store it, if I was going to shove it in a shipping container for a couple of years while I shipped off somewhere, I probably would put um, oily rags over the top just to help keep it in good condition, um, especially if you're going to shove it in a barn for a while. Um, saying that, that's pretty much it when it comes to anvils. Um, you know, it's a great big lump of steel for hitting hot metal on. 
I uh, hope you guys have found this interesting and informative. Remember to click like and subscribe. As always, you can follow us on Instagram, keep up to date with what we've been doing. Uh, you can support the channel on Patreon, help us to make more videos for you guys. I hope you click like and subscribe, and we'll see you here next time in the workshop. Cheers, guys.